Hello and welcome to the last of our study in this series of GBC at Home on What is Church. So far we've learnt that we are God's church, his gift to Christ, and we've looked at rules for worship and how the church carries out God's plan on earth through worship, discipleship and evangelism. We've looked at leadership and church growth. Last week, Eric hinted at our topic for this week in describing it as the fuel which drives the church. That fuel is prayer. Now, I'm not negating the importance of individual prayer here. Indeed, scripture instructs us as to this in Matthew 6, verse 6. And I know that we'll look at this in a later series. But as this study is on what is church, I'm focusing for now on corporate prayer. Charles Haddon Spurgeon considered the faithful praying members at London Tabernacle as the powerhouse of the church. The engine room, as he called it, was the basement where people gathered together to pray regularly. According to Spurgeon, the prayer meeting is the thermometer of the church today. A healthy one at normal temperature, around 37 degrees. One that's maybe not quite so well, tending to hypothermia at less than 35. Or one at fever pitch, doing really well, at over 38. We need as a church and as individuals to re-examine our priorities in regard to prayer and ask ourselves some searching questions. Do we sidestep or neglect prayer? And is that why the church can be seen sometimes to lack power and vibrancy? Before we go on, just pause for a moment and discuss what you think our temperature is on the prayer scale at GBC. And why do you think that? Welcome back. I think there's value in establishing at the outset what we mean by prayer. The answer many would give is talking to God. Of course, that's part of it, but I would suggest it's so much more. It's about having a rapport with God, a close, harmonious relationship, a two-way process of communing, sharing, communicating, listening, and one where we can be taught and disciplined. When we think of corporate prayer then, this is between us as a church and our God. Before the fall, we see in Genesis that God desired this type of relationship with his people, the fruit of his creation. It appears that Adam and Eve were accustomed to communing with God in the serene coolness of the evening. It was only after sin entered that the barrier was formed and a mediator was required to restore a right relationship. Throughout the Old Testament, we see how God uses a mediator to save a people. We think of Noah, of Abraham and Moses, and it's this intercession on behalf of the people that gives life to the idea of corporate prayer. In Exodus, we find that the people of Israel collectively groaned and collectively worshipped, and we get some description of how they prayed. In 1 Kings, we see Solomon leading the nation in prayer, and Elijah offering public prayer at his confrontation with the prophets of Baal. Some of the Psalms were intended for corporate worship and prayer, for example, Psalm 44 and Psalm 136, that one is written in the call and response style. We also have examples of corporate prayer in the post-exilic era in the books of Chronicles and Ezra. As we look to the New Testament, we celebrate the birth of Christ, the Son of God in human form come to become the si final sacrifice for sin and our mediator before the throne of God in heaven. Jesus taught people to pray, united in one Father, our Father, of course known as the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. 
a prayer not only to pray for individuals, but also for each other, a framework on which to build all our prayer. In Acts 2, we see one of the things the early church was devoted to was prayer. And in 1 Timothy, Paul focuses on the prayer life of the church. God's plan is for the church to be a people where prayer abounds. In the Gospel of Mark, Christ describes the temple as a house of prayer for all nations. If we're honest, though, most of us struggle with prayer for many different reasons. What can we learn then about the characteristics of a praying church? First, a praying church prioritises prayer. Paul writes that, first of all, prayers are to be offered on behalf of all people. The word urge in this verse also stresses the need for prayer to be a priority. Sadly, this is sometimes not the case, and for some churches, the notices take longer than the prayer time. Secondly, a praying church prays for everyone. Paul tells us that we are to pray, request and intercede for everyone, to persevere in prayer and to give thanks in all circumstances. In Ephesians, we're instructed to pray for all the saints, the global church, as all are part of the body of Christ. Number three, a praying church prays for authorities. We should pray for those in authority over us, those who govern. This was perhaps a startling new consideration for the early church in Paul's time when Nero ruled and Christians were persecuted. God can change the hearts of ruthless rulers and corrupt regimes. Number four, a praying church prays for its spiritual leaders. We must remember Paul's call to pray for our pastors, teachers and those who lead. If we neglect them in prayer, it not only affects them, but ultimately the entire church community. Number five, a praying church prays evangelistically. Paul challenges us to pray for the salvation of all people, as God's desire is that none should perish. As we pray for all people and for those in authority, we should constantly pray for their salvation. God has chosen to build his kingdom through his church, and that includes their prayers. Number six, a praying church prays with the right attitude. We should pray without anger or dispute. We're urged to pray with holy hands. Clean hands were symbolic of a blameless life. When we have unconfessed sin, it hinders our prayer life, both as individuals and as the church. We must first confess and repent, resolving any disputes before our prayers can be unhindered. We should also pray in faith with expectation and trust in God and the promises of his word. Only God, by his divine power, can transform. And corporate prayer is about cooperating with God to bring about his plan and not to try and bend him to ours. Prayer is a discipline that needs practice. We learn to pray. It's not easy. Indeed, Paul acknowledges that Epaphras struggles in prayer. Martin Lord Jones suggested that there is nothing that tells the truth about us as Christian people so much as our prayer life. Ouch. Let's try then at GBC to stoke the fire and regularly refuel the engine to get excited about prayer. Let's attend the prayer meeting with a sense of expectation and most of all seek to give God glory as we seek his divine will. So it's over to you now to look at some of the questions suggested by this study 
and how we can apply them at GBC. Thank you for listening and be blessed as you share and pray together.